Today, I'm continuing the series that I began where we were um, talking about being a better ally and with different kinds of identities. And today we're looking at being a good ally, being a good ally with differing abilities, differing abilities. Um, so as we talk about this, there are gonna be some words that we'll be using. And uh, so I thought I'd start off with just defining these words so that when they come up in other areas, as we talk about being a good ally, you'll know what we are talking about. So here are some definitions and a little bit of discussion of each of these kinds of each of these things as we inform ourselves more. This, by the way, this particular uh, sermon is going to have a good bit of information for you. And you may want to hit your print screen and save some of this um, because I think it's a very important, a very important way for us to go forward in this world today, especially as we're trying to go forward even virtually. How can we be better allies and be more welcoming to those with differing abilities? So one of the words that we hear discuss is ableism. It's one of the isms. It's a form of discrimination. It's the false idea that disabled people are by default inferior when in truth disability is just another way for a mind and or body to be. That's one definition of ableism. And here uh, is something that we need to be aware of. Most of us for much of our lives, for so the last 30 years actually, we have had the ADA. That's the American with Disabilities Act and how thankful we are that that came along. You know, some people say that you can't legislate ethics and motivation, but indeed, uh, and morality, but indeed some legislation helps us do the right thing sometimes, you know? And so this was some legislation that came about 30 years ago that helped open up doors for many more folks. And it's been updated and updated and updated as we've tried to become more and more accommodating. Uh, that's 30 years of the American Disabilities Act. Then there's the word TAB or T-A-B. Now, when I see TAB, this is what I think about, but this is what it's not. <laughs> of course, this is the soft drink TAB. And I don't know if you all are aware of it, but finally Coca-Cola has just now given up that soft drink. It is resting in peace now. Since 1963, we've had tab around, or at least some people have. 2020, it has gone away. And that is not the tab, the T-A-B we're talking about. What we're talking about here is temporarily able-bodied, which if you're not someone with one of the uh, uh, disabilities or differing abilities, that's what you are is a tab. You are temporarily able-bodied. It's a term often used by the disability community and sometimes by those who are able-bodied to confirm awareness that any of us, any of us may become disabled at any time. So this is one identity that we all are very aware of because it's the kind of, it's even if you are very able-bodied, you may not be tomorrow even. So you are temporarily able-bodied. Then there are, is the term ability privilege or able-bodied privilege. We've talked about privilege in other contexts all through this whole series, but we do have ability privilege as well. Um, able-bodied privilege or ability privilege is an advantage people gain simply because they're not limited by physical or mental impairments. And like other privileges, it's something that sometimes we are not that aware of because it doesn't challenge us. So we don't think about it. But we are what we're doing in these services is trying to make people aware of these things so we will think about it. Sometimes able-bodied people perceive themselves as quote normal. And I've always heard too that uh, normal is just a statistic, right? And wrongly presume that everyone else has the same opportunities, abilities, and access, not even aware that they have access and abilities that many others do not. Becoming aware of privilege should not be viewed as a burden or source of guilt. You know, we're not trying to guilt people because they have a privilege of able-bodiedness, but rather an opportunity to learn and be responsible so that we may work toward a more just and inclusive world. These are the same things we've said on the, with the other sermons that awareness is the first step. We have to be aware of our privileges. And we have some privileges of some things in our bodies and some things we have 
uh, that may be that we don't have privileges, that we are challenged more, but we all need to be aware of these as we go through our lives. I ask you folks to tell me if when you became, maybe sometime that when you became aware of your ability privilege or that you did, or that you did not have that privilege that some folks have. And I'm gonna share with you some of the things that some, and I asked this on Facebook, so some of you may, that are not on Facebook didn't see it and I apologize, but I was trying to get some input for the sermon. And this is some things that were shared with me that folks in these two congregations shared about becoming aware of their privileges or being aware that they did not have some of these privileges. One of you said, taking a friend out to eat and there was no access for his wheelchair from car to restaurant door. It has since been corrected, thankfully. Inviting another friend to visit pre-pandemic and realizing her wheelchair would not fit through my bathroom door. Another says, watching my friend having to park in the middle of the parking lot to allow his wife to exit the specially equipped van because someone had parked over the lines in the handicapped spaces. Another says, once went hiking through a boulder field with a blind friend who navigated the terrain beautifully with her cane. Later, she was telling someone else how I let her hike through a boulder field. And I was stunned that she used that language that sighted people would think they could access her capabilities better than she could and would take that agency away from her. Another said, I was made very aware of it when, I was taken, when it was taken away from me in a car accident when I was 34 and it took almost 10 years to even be close to how I am now. That's one of those situations where one day you may be fine and the next day not. Another said, my mother used to teach the blind at a local museum when I was small. They used to feel, they used to feel faces as a reference for their bus. And as a child, embarrassingly, I was deeply uncomfortable with that. It took time to realize they were seeing and processing the world around them through their hands. I think that was the first time I felt ability privileged. They were talented people and it made me sad that they were in a museum filled with amazing art that they couldn't see. And then another said, when my spouse spent his waking hours in a wheelchair, I was constantly reminded I could just walk out the door, get in my car and go. He had to be brought to the car, transferred on a board to the car, and then the same was required when we arrived at the destination. Another example was how when we were together, people would ask me questions about him. What would he like to eat, a waitress would ask. Also, people used to infantilize him. For instance, they would say, are you being a good boy today? Or even worse, when they would ask me, is he being a good boy today? I recently saw that as I was with my mom while she was in the hospital. Some of the, not all of them, but some of the caretakers in the hospital, when they see me, her daughter in there, would talk to me about her condition instead of speaking to her. Well, my mom has all her sensibilities and just because she's old, and in the bed doesn't mean they should not speak to her. We make those assumptions when we see that someone is challenged in one way or another. Another term that I became aware of was inspiration porn. Inspiration porn. This is the portrayal of people with disabilities as inspiration solely or in part on the basis of this, their disability. They objectify disabled people for the benefit of non-disabled people. I worried about that a little bit when I, because I was using that Emmanuel's rod, but uh, I realized what he was doing was trying to inspire other disabled people and tell, share his story about this and sharing openly. Um, so, um, but it is something we think should think about. Look at these charts here. You know, these are things that this is inspira good examples of inspiration porn having a poster that says, before you quit, try, and then having showing a picture of a disabled child with a pen in her mouth. It's almost like to make you feel, well, at least I'm not like that. Or as we used to hear when we were growing up, by the grace of God, you know, there go I, that kind of thing. Not good, not good. And then here's another woman uh, with prosthetics. And then this is from Workout Magazine saying, so what's your excuse again? Those are the kinds of things that are called information porn and especially uh, by this woman who I'm fixing to show you her name is um, 
Hold on a minute. I wrote it down because I knew I'd forget. Stella Young. Her name is Stella Young. She's quite good. And she shared a little bit about her. Stella Young was teaching uh, in a high school class and she realized, became aware of how some people were seeing her. Listen to what she shares in this brief excerpt from her tab talk, from her um, TED talk. This boy put up his hand and said, hey miss, when are you gonna start doing your speech? And I said, what speech? You know, I'd been talking to them about defamation law for a good 20 minutes. And uh, he said, you know, like your motivational speaking. You know, when people in wheelchairs come to school, they usually say like, inspirational stuff. <laughs> yeah. It's usually in the big hall. <laughs> and that's when it dawned on me. This kid had only ever experienced disabled people as objects of inspiration. We are not, you know, to this kid, and it's not his fault. I mean, that's true for many of us. You know, for lots of us, disabled people are not our teachers or our doctors or our manicurists. We're not real people. We are there to inspire. Um, and in fact, you know, I'm sitting on this stage looking like I do in this wheelchair, and you are probably kind of expecting me to inspire you, right? <laughs> Yeah. Well, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I'm afraid I'm going to disappoint you dramatically. I'm not here to inspire you. I'm here to tell you that we have been lied to about disability. Yeah, we've been sold the lie that disability is a bad thing. Capital B, capital T. It's a bad thing. And to live with disability makes you exceptional. It's not a bad thing and it doesn't make you exceptional. And in the- She goes on to share some stories from her time in school and others where uh, this has been made relevant that she's supposed to be an inspiration for other people, not a person living her life. Um, so that's another term that we need to be aware of. And when people talk about inspiration porn, it's when we use disabled people as inspiration for other folks to be able to do better. And that's not how, what we should be doing. Another term is internalized ableism, internalized. And we've talked about, you know, you've, I've heard the word used with other kinds of things, like uh, people talk about people with internalized homophobia, but internalized ableism. This is uh, when folks who do have, who are challenged, um, are made to feel so bad about it that they, they are always constantly comparing themselves with others. So here's a Here's a guy saying, I will never get a job. I'm not good enough. I'm broken and need to be fixed. I'm asking too much. Internalized oppression occurs when one group of people recognizes a distinct inequality of value compared to another group of people. So no wonder that they feel that way because of how our society does. So it's natural to have some of this internalized oppression. And as a result, desires to be more like the highly valued group. And that has come with all the different kinds of isms that we've talked about. We see folks with internalized uh, oppression because society um, disvalues them. And that's what's going to happen. And in fact, with this person, this is writer Eleanor Fraser, Barber. Uh, you see her there with Anchor, her guide dog. She shares a lot in her writings about um, how for quite some time she had this, you know, um, these feelings, she was very hurt when people would say things to her about her face or whatever. And it took her quite a long time to overcome that um, internalized oppression, but she has and now is a great advocate for the disability community. And she tells many different stories in her writings and you can look her up, but one I'll share with you is she talks about how we shouldn't shush children for their curiosity about people that are different. You know, if you have a child, a young child with you and they ask about something, we should, oh, hush, 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 and not answer them, not try to respond. They are naturally curious. And she says both to the folks with, with ability challenges and also to others of us, do not uh, try to dissuade that curiosity and try instead try to be honest and helpful with the children. And she talked about a, a, when she was visiting a school, uh, a child that came up to her and said, what happened to your face? Which she had been asked many times growing up and as an adult as well, what happened to your face? And she says, well, I'm different than, my face is different than yours. And she said, and we all have differences. And she said, for instance, your eyes are blue 
and I see that your friend's eyes over there are brown. You have different colored eyes. And she said something like, "When you, I see that you have you have brown hair, and your teacher's hair is blonde, you look different. You have different. You're different than one another." And she says, "And and and you have two eyes, and I have one eye." And she said, "The child's eyes lit up and said, oh yeah, we're different.'" And then the child took off and ran over to a cubby and got her teddy bear and brought back the teddy bear and said, "Look." My teddy has one eye like you. He's different like you, not like me. And she thought that was just a delightful way because the child was then seeing that one-eyed teddy, not as broken or needing fix, but as different. Uh, so that's a good story for us to think about and how we, how we share with children and explain to children rather than just shush them up when they become curious. And I'm thankful to Ellen for sharing that story that I could then share with you all. So <clears throat> what we're talking about today is we, now we have these terms, we have these understandings and need to have more. This is just a little, there's so much more we can learn. But we want to say, how can we now? We wanna be better allies, we wanna do better. And so I'm gonna share a little bit uh, of what I've learned. And I'm first of all gonna share with you some, um, some things shared by, in an article in Mashable.com by Katie DePierre. She interviewed various people about the challenges and how we can be better allies. And these are some of the things that she has shared. One, and this is what we talked about just a minute ago, don't use people with disabilities as your own inspiration for you to rise above your challenges. Stella Young says, we all learn how to use our bodies to the best of their capacity. Recognize that people with disabilities aren't intrinsically exceptional for getting out of the bed in the morning they might just get out of the bed in a different way. I had one woman yesterday that saw me doing my fast walking on the beach and she was an older woman like me and she stopped me. We stayed apart and we're socially distant, but I took my earphone out of my ear so I could hear. And she says, I just want to tell you how proud I am of you <laughs> because I was out there doing my fast walking. And I said, well, I'm proud of you too because she was obviously out on the beach walking. She said, well, I used to run and you could tell she had a bonus body. She said, but then, I had problems with my lungs and I can't run anymore. And I said, yes, but you are doing what you can. And she said, yes, and we thumbs up and went on. So all of us are, should, are doing what we can. We may do it differently, but we are doing what we can. Um, so we don't need to use folks with various disabilities as inspiration to help us rise above our challenges. Don't do that's that's what she refers to. And I, I, I get it now. I didn't get that inspiration form before, but I, I think I'm getting it now. Also, view aids that enhance the lives of people with disabilities as more than just devices. This is a part really of their world. My my eyeglasses are not just something that, you know, that I would want people to say, oh, I like that. Let me try them on and take them off of me and put them on or do whatever. No, I need these, don't, this is me, you know, please let me keep my glasses on my face. We can, many of us with glasses understand that, but other devices are similar. These aids act as an extension of a person and you should respect them as part of that person. So don't lean on their wheelchair, you know, or just push it when they don't want you to. Don't pet or feed the dog unless they invite you to. Don't look at the interpreter rather than the person they are interpreting for. Now, I know that's somewhat hard for some of us because we're not used to it, but try as much as possible to look at the person that is doing the communicating if you can. <clears throat> also, understand a person's disability doesn't define her, but may be an important part of her identity. Changing your language to refer to people first is an important step to, toward inclusivity. Not just to say, well, somebody's a diabetic, but talk about the person first. This is my friend and they need a special diet because they you know, have this, this need because of the diabetes. And instead of using a person's identity as their defining characteristic, refer to her disability only when necessary to the conversation. Also listen and see what the disability means to them. Some people want that lifted up because it's an important part of their identity, but listen, don't make those assumptions. So here's this person trying to do the right thing. And she says, 
is this meeting space accessible? My coworker, Chloe, is coming to the meeting and she uses a wheelchair. So she first of all talks, says the person's name, identifies their relationship as a coworker. And then she says she needs, she uses a wheelchair. So she wants to see if the space is accessible. Never have low expectations of someone with a disability. Don't adjust your expectations based on your own biases. Instead, work with people living with disabilities to properly accommodate their needs. You don't know at first. You have to listen, you have to work. If any, if, if any adjustment is even necessary, it may be that you don't need to adjust anything. Don't assume someone's disability defines their overall ability. That is a um, quote from Carol Glazer, who is president of the National Organization on Disability. She was one of the people interviewed for this article. She says, you can't assume difficulty speaking means difficulty thinking. Well, I think we've seen, been aware of that as the <clears throat> candidates have had their uh, debates and speeches, how one of the candidates seems to think or points out that somebody having a trouble getting some words out may, have, may be evidence of cognitive ability, and it is not. You can't assume difficulty speaking means difficulty thinking, and many other things as well. Don't have low expectations. Also, don't assume people living with disabilities are miserable, unhappy, or less fulfilled than you. Here's a child who's obviously displaying quite happiness and pleasure. Like any able-bodied person, people with disabilities adapt to accommodate their own experiences. But that's not something that makes a person living with disabilities less fortunate or clearly miserable. And then stop being afraid of disability. I know as a child, because growing up in the 50s, because we didn't have the American Disabilities Act at that time, and, and many people did not come out. They didn't have ways to have access to be out. You see somebody that was very different and you naturally had some sort of fear because you had not seen it before. We have got to stop being afraid of disability. Get out of our comfort zone. Able-bodied people don't often talk about disability and the fear of getting something wrong or offensive keeps us from addressing it. You know, I even, as I was preparing this talk, I was like, can I use the term disability? Because I know some people don't like it. Some people do say that's how it's still used commonly. I titled the topic differing abilities, but then most of the things I was reading and most of the quotes I was reading use disability. So I'm, I'm using both, but I could have just said, oh, I'm afraid I might say the wrong thing and just not do this service. No, you can't do that. Just realize you're gonna make a mistake. And I have friends that will tell me afterwards, I'm sure, where some things were problematic and then I will do, I will listen, I will listen to you and I will do better, I promise. So we might even accidentally point out that we aren't as comfortable with disabilities we want the world to believe. Just, you could admit that sometimes, but then get out of your comfort zone. That's where the magic happens, right? That's where we learn when we challenge ourselves and get out of our comfort zone. Well, those, are, those came from some of the literature I was reading, but then some of our own members, one family that's had more than their challenges, share of challenges with, with uh, uh, ability, physical and otherwise from their, within, within their own family and extended family, some very visible and some invisible, shared with me some tips. And they said that I could share with these, these with you anonymously. Now, some of these overlap with some of the things I've already shared, but I wanted to share them just as they shared them with me because they were worded so well and I think are meaningful for us. So here they are. Understand that you do not know another person's experience unless they tell you about it. Things change often invisibly. Everyone is only temporarily able. Bodies and brains are designed to deteriorate. Accidents, illness and heredity can render anyone disabled. Don't assume what a disabled person can or cannot do. Speaking loudly to people in wheelchairs is unnecessary. Address them as you would any other human being and check your motives before engaging. 
Notice if you tend to avoid people with obvious disabilities. Ask yourself why you're doing that. Aim to connect as one human being with another, not as a seemingly perfect person with a seemingly imperfect person. Unless you're a professional in the disabled person's particular challenges, resist the urge to offer treatments or cures. Instead, ask open-ended questions and be willing to listen without judging or interrupting. Avoid commenting on how someone looks unless they ask you to do so. Declaring that they look good, look bad, don't look sick, reflects poorly on you. Disable does not equal sick. Here's an important one for me as well. Practice not knowing. Things are always changing. If someone felt a certain way a month ago or yesterday, don't assume that's still the case. All good recommendations. So we invite you, we invite you as Unitarian Universalists, as visitors, whoever you are, to join the movement as allies, our folks in the disabled world, join the movement to try to open doors and make things better. And there are so many organizations working with this. I just put the logos up for just some of them, but there are many organizations working with this. And some of you may be members of some of those. I know I'm a member of NAMI, but there are many that are doing wonderful, wonderful work. Well, what about us though? Bringing it home to you, you. Yes, we too are trying to do within our congregations and within our denominations, better work. And we call our program Equal Access with two U's, of course, and equal. Equal access. And then it says equals and it has those doors opening. I love that. Just opening up doors, making access possible. To enable the full engagement of people with disabilities in Unitarian Universalist communities and the broader society. Because we've realized that we haven't always done a good job with this. I've shared with you all that I was at a... Um, UU General Assembly just a few years ago, and that one of the people up on the stage during the service of the living tradition, every time they would say something, uh, sing or say anything, would stand or walk or run in it, because we use those metaphors a whole lot. The woman on the stage in the, um, that was in her scooter and was unable to walk, she had an ouch sign and she would lift up the ouch, ouch, ouch. Well, I mean, she was, every time you turn around, she was lifting it up, which really, brought it home to us. At first it bothered me, then I thought, no, she is sharing with us how much we use these metaphors. Now, it's not that we don't ever use them again. In fact, we heard the wonderful song, well, ne you'll never walk alone. But when we use them so much, we need to be aware of that and, and work on it. And we have, Unitarian Universalists have, our standing on the side of love now has changed their uh, name to side with love. Uh, the popular song, standing on the side of love that we sing in our church, uh, Jason Shelton changed the words to answering the call of love, which I really love that. So yes, there are things we can do in Unitarian Universalism. Here are some, go here are some, here are some goals that we have. One is raising awareness, empowering change, and promoting a framework for advocacy grounded in our Unitarian Universalist faith. Providing resources to help Unitarian Universalist communities become barrier-free and inclusive incorporating the gifts of ministry offered by people with disabilities into the faith community, bringing more of those folks in and having them share. Enabling Unitarian Universalist congregations to understand and minister to the spiritual and personal needs of people with disabilities, their families and friends. And collaborating with other Unitarian Universalist organizations and the Unitarian Universalist Association to counter oppression. Can we, can we lift up those goals and can we do those things? Can we commit, can we commit to being better allies for those who are differently abled? I say, yes, we will. Yes, we can, yes, we will. Yes, we must. 
Yes, we must. May it be so. May it be so.